Greetings all. We are back for part three of our little story of Belgian army history, and we've actually come to a new facility for the War Heritage Institute. It's a little bit east of Antwerp, but don't worry about it. With me again is Mr. William Testert, former corporal chef and general institution of the Belgian military, apparently. But anyway, so when we last uh, left off, we had just finished World War II, and Belgium had just set up the first corps in Germany. The Cold War has begun. Where do we go from here? Well, we actually sent a volunteer battalion to Korea. Uh, it ended up with 4,000 people rotating through Korea. And in Korea, we were, of course, uh, under command first of the British Commonwealth, and then later we joined the 3rd Infantry Division of the American Army. And there we were trained on the Pershing M26. Some officers got training there uh, in new combat techniques. And then uh, with the Korean War started a crash program to rearm the European armies. And one of these programs was an American one called the Mutual Defense Aid Program. So in the color of that Mutual Defense Aid Program, we got, for starters, 300 Pershing's M26. And these were the first really modern tanks uh, of the Belgian army. These replaced the Fireflies? They replaced uh, gradually the Fireflies, yes, indeed. Uh, our people had to be trained on these things because they were uh, totally unknown to us. And later on, uh, we slowly moved on to the Patton M47, but before that we got the M46, 10 of them, uh, which were used in a training center in Belgium. Um, and was, uh, it was planned to make a NATO training center, but in the end nothing came to it. Uh, in the museum in Brussels, in our documentation, we have the photos of the first three instructors sent to the United States to train, to train on, the, on the M46, which was different from the M426. Right. But it's a good training vehicle for the 47, because the yes, bottom half is yes, always the we same. Yes, we had ten of them, and I think the museum has several of them in, in storage or in stock somewhere. And so the main battle horse of the Belgian army for about 30 years became the M47, uh, which was for that time, a second-hand a second hand tank for the Americans because they were already moving to the M48. But France got it, Italy got it, Norway got it, Belgium got it. So it was, the Germans used it extensively, so it was kind of standardization avant la lettre. And so the Patton served as well for a great many years. Okay, so what was happening in the infantry world? I mean, was, it, was, was the Belgian sector of, of NATO defense is presumably the northern part where it's a lot flatter and more open, so mm -hmm. better suited to tanks? I wouldn't say that. Uh, we got uh, our own sector, which was a former British uh, army sector and then passed on to the Belgians, first B Corps. Uh, it was quite a big, big thing for the, Belgian, for the Belgians. We are a small country. And at, at that time we had, I think, 8 million inhabitants. And at the, the peak of the, the, the effort, we had four divisions. So uh, one tank division and three infantry divisions. So they were mostly equipped with American material, uh, like this M47, of course, but we also had 156 M41s. Uh, and we had 1,000 and a little bit uh, of M75s. Uh, the advantage of that was that it's all the same logistical system. So the engines were quite the same. The spare parts we could plug into the American system. So it gave us great advantages and very uh, powerful uh, first B Corps for a couple of years. The, the Belgium, I think, is the only country that used the M75 other than the Americans? Yes, I think there were five or six delivered to the Moroccans. Mm -hmm. I discovered that recently, but no trace to be found except one picture. And we used them for more than 30 years, yes, absolutely. Any idea why Belgium selected them, if no other country did? They were the cheapest. <laughs> I can't argue that. If, you, if you're paying for four divisions of personnel, I'm, I'm assuming the Americans didn't give you money for that, they just gave the money to buy the equipment. Well, they were taking out the M75, so they practically gave it to us. We also had chaffees, we also got half tracks, we got the M44 artillery, we got the M55. The advantage of that was it was all the same type of engine, the same type of cross drive, same type of road wheels, tracks, everything was a little bit standardized. Uh, unfortunately, the Americans got away from this, but it was very much, uh, very much standardized uh, equipment. Everything was nearly usable from one to another. 
and we simply plugged into the American uh, logistical system and we got whatever we wanted and we paid for it, of course. But it was overall far cheaper than buying new equipment or because the Germans were developing new equipment, the French were developing new equipment, but this was all very early. So the advantage with the Americans is uh, you ask, they deliver, you pay, and that's it. So for all of this period, from you know, the original reforming of the Belgian army to the end of the Cold War, was conscription constant or was that only for a part of it? No, uh, the army uh, was conscript driven. Uh, we had conscripts driving tanks, firing tanks, commanding tanks. They were quite well trained, I must say. And uh, I think they were quite proud of doing what they did. Uh, they were quite good. Uh, we consistently had very high results on the Canadian Army Trophy uh, uh, training exercise, even with the M47. Uh, it was consistently very, very high level. Uh, we could kick a door with a 90 millimeter at 1,000 meters, not a problem. That mm. was normal practice. In the end, of course, the tanks became old. They were in need of modernization. Uh, we had 773 of them. Then came in a French program and a um, German program, uh, the Leopard and the AMX-30. We evaluated them and then in the end we did buy the Leopard uh, 1 tank. Okay, so as I'm looking across, I mean, at, at this era, just if we walk over here, we have a, a nice little selection in this. So we're going to show it off a, a little bit. So I mean, we have a nice selection of tanks of the era. So Panzer 68, Chieftain, AMX-30, AMX-13, okay, uh, and there's lots of M Leopards, you've seen them before. So is there, when, when you went to the Leopard, do you know why one that was chosen out of this group that you have here? Yeah, well, they were extensively tested um, and evaluated. And so, so did the Dutch Army, by the way, late, a little bit later than we did. Every country did its own testing. Uh, so in the end, what was the result of this? Uh, the chieftain was considered to be very well armed and armored, but uh, already in those days the engine was considered to be not up to standards, it was not really good. Uh, we also evaluated the M60, which unfortunately we are missing here. Uh, it was considered to be a good tank, but nothing exceptionally better than the M47. So in the end, uh, we tested the, M the Leopard and the AMX-30, and for some reason, the AMX-30 was considered superior to the then produced Leopard tank. Why? Mainly through its optics of the top seven turret for the tank commander, which was considered far better than the Leopard uh, at that time. Uh, unfortunately, the French could only produce uh, less than the Germans and they were more expensive. So we went for the, fortunately, we went for the Leopard one. So in addition to the Leopards, you also end up with a lot of CVRTs, mm -hmm. Scorpions, Scimitars, and so yes. on. You know, we've got you know, a Scimitar in the back of the flatbed here. Did they come at the same time or were they a bit later? They were a bit later. There's always kind of overlap. Then the Armored Corps got its program financed, then the Infantry Corps got its program financed. So there's always a little bit of overlap. The CVRTs, CVRTs came about when it was time to replace the M41. So we don't have a tradition in Belgium of refurbishing vehicles, uh, certainly not at that time. And for some reason, I really don't understand, they were never interested in putting a diesel engine in it, like the Danish did, for example. So they want a totally new vehicle. Uh, the only program at that time that was reasonably close to what we needed was the CVRT program, of which we ended up with more than 700 uh, vehicles good for uh, three reconnaissance cavalry battalions and uh, support in the tank battalions and the infantry uh, battalions in the plat recce platoons. The CVRT was of course British but was built under license in Belgium. And did you split it about 50-50 scimitar scorpion for the gun tanks or did you have a preference? No, the, we used a different tactic than the British. Uh, the British used a scimitar for long-range reconnaissance uh, and they use Scorpion for short range re reconnaissance. We paired them pretty much like we did uh, in the Second World War with the Daimler Dingo and the Daimler Armored Car. So we paired Scimitar and Scorpion, and you had several of these in one platoon. And then you had uh, the Spartans coming in with the light infantry uh, in support. 
And then we got the strikers who were very handy for anti-tank uh, fight because we used our CVTs not purely for the reconnaissance role, but also to, of course, reconnaissance the enemy, but to do um, combat, um, s slowing the enemy down. Guard or cover. Cover the, the, cover the, the army so that the, the big combat units have time to form and go to their battle uh, areas. So the, the missions of the CVRT were far more elaborate than in the British Army. I can see that. So you, you mentioned the, uh, the swing fire anti-tanks, the, uh, the striker vehicles. Belgium had a layered anti-tank defense you were talking yesterday. So mm -hmm. how did that layering work? Well, the swing fire was only used in the reconnaissance battalions. And the, every squadron had an uh, anti-tank platoon in support. So we could lay uh, an ambush killing ground at up to about 4,000 meters. So sometimes the idea was to draw the enemy into these killing grounds. Uh, we, tr we tried that several times and the Americans were very good in doing what we wanted them to do. Uh, and so we could fire the very long range with the swing fire. The layers I talked to you about was more something for the infantry, where the infantry com an infantry company at that time had several Milan uh, in its platoons. The Milan intervened up to 2,000 meters, and if Russian tanks survived that, the GPK, Jagdpanzer Kanone, came into the fray. Which are these yokes yes. over here. Yes. So again, not many export users of the Jagdpanzer Kanone. Germany, Belgium, <laughs> and that's pretty much it. Pretty much it, yeah. Did, uh, so does this differ from the German specification? Yes, the drivetrain is a little bit different. The road wheels are different if you put, if you put two of them next to each other, you will see it. The, the German uh, Jagdpanzer is a, seems a little bit lighter of construction. Uh, the road wheels are Leopard types. The engine is a 500 HP. It's the same as the Leopard with minus uh, five, um, two cylinders. Uh, the, the gearbox is from the Marder. Uh, it's not the original gearbox. The, the gearbox is from the Marder. The gun is a Rheinmetall 90 millimeter which was compatible with the stocks, the huge stocks of 90 millimeter rounds we still had, and the Germans had them too. But we also added a Belgian laser fire control system. And on the rear deck, not only were there smoke grenades, but also a Liren, a double Liren mortar system to give light on the battlefield uh, whenever it was needed. Was this a well-liked vehicle? It was absolutely well-liked. Um, it was a superb vehicle. Uh, success, successive crews were maintaining a high level uh, of training. Uh, where, uh, when you go to the gunnery ranges, a normal tank platoon goes forward and fires when it goes forward. The GPK platoon worked differently. They drove backwards all the time and they uh, had to fire when driving backwards. So that means that the tank commander not only had to give his orders to the gunners and, and uh, to attack the targets, but also had to look back all the time to guide his driver uh, to not to hit anything. So it was a totally different tactic. Uh, the units were very good. Uh, they were very high standards of discipline and they mastered their vehicles. Even the drafted soldiers got into it because it was mostly crews with half uh, uh, personnel, drafted personnel and half professional prof personnel. But somehow they had a very high standard of them. Uh, training and they kept it on till the last day. Were the tank were the crews of the JPKs considered tank crew, cavalry, artillery, what was their infantry. There were there was yes. infantry. Yes, in infantry, infantry, yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, an anti tank battalion at that time had a company of GPKs and two companies of M one trees uh, with Milan. Uh, most of the time they worked in a distributed way, so they were in direct support of the infantry company. An infantry company could have one GPK and then apply the, the rules I explained uh, with the layered defense. The GPK providing, of course, a rolling fire. You could fire eight rounds a minute with that thing. So whenever the Milans, there were more Milans, there was one Milan section per platoon. Uh, and then they got the GPK in, in uh, oversight, if you want, or in direct support. And uh, that was the, the, the game we played then, yes. So what was the position of the Belgian army in, let's say, 1990? Cold War ends, what happens? Do you immediately stop conscription? Do you re immediately downsize? Do you change focus? We immediately uh, stopped conscription, which had a huge effect on the army. 
because the, the army was built around conscription. And so we pulled back out of Germany in five years. So the whole army came back to Belgium uh, in a state of disarray, uh, not really knowing what to do, because at the same time we engaged ourselves in uh, humanitarian operations in the Balkan, which are fundamentally totally different operations for what the army trained for, for all these 50 years or whatever they stayed in Germany. So I can say without too much exaggeration, I think, that the army the ground forces were in disarray, not really knowing where the enemy was. Uh, we, as a paradox, we modernized our Leopard ones, mm -hmm. partially. Uh, we kept the M13s and the armored infantry vehicles, which we used extensively uh, in um, humanitarian operations. The CVRTs came into their own again. They went to Somalia. Uh, they went to rescue missions, uh, airborne rescue missions uh, in Rwanda. They were deployed in uh, Bosnia and in the Balkan as a general uh, rule, but they were fundamentally different operations than we were trained for. So the crews were reduced, uh, the personnel cadre was totally reduced, but at the same time we had to maintain a high tempo of, of things because rotations were on every four months. So that means that you have to send one unit, let's say a CVRT squadron, but you have to prepare already two other units to, to supplement when they have to rotate. So it was a very strainful, very busy, uh, very stressful period for the, the Belgian ground forces. Yeah. Recruiting was a very problem because, well, okay, recruiting professional soldiers, you also need to adapt your mentality. The Belgian army for more than 50 years had its contingent of draftees and now they had to start trying to get people into the army, which is something they were not used to. And the generals of that time did not really understand. They said, well, the country has to provide uh, our, our contingent. And the country said, no, 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 you will have to try to recruit. So it's a, to a totally mi new mindset. So um, it gave you the impression of an army not really knowing what to do. Mm. And at the same time, maintaining a very high tempo in operations they were not really used to. Uh, but in general, the soldiers uh, did a good job. Uh, I don't think there were much incidents. There were a little bit, not too much. Uh, and since recruiting did not show up as it should be, the army became older and older. And we are paying this till today. So 2013 or so, a decision was made. We're going to get rid of the leopards. Yes. I presume because, partially because at this point they're old. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, is that the only reason, <coughs> or was it just a, a little bit more? It's a double, double case. Um, firstly, the Minister of Defence at that time uh, didn't want to invest in heavy stuff. He got rid of nearly everything. He didn't see the point, okay. uh, because why do we need tanks? And for that reason, we were quite fortunate, because at a certain point in the Kosovo, we deployed a squadron of Leopard tanks. The first time ever Belgian Leopard tanks were engaged uh, outside the country. And they managed pretty well. They were modernized with uh, thermal imaging and they had good results. They were good. But then, of course, the army said, well, they are nearly 50 years old. They are getting really old. And uh, we don't know if we will find the spare parts. Huh? That's always the same story. Suddenly, nobody finds the spare parts of these things. Yeah. Eh? Uh, and then they were phased out. The last parade was in 2014. I personally saw uh, civilians cry because they served on the leopard tank. And it was pretty much heavy for the army because no tanks, no army. Yeah. So uh, recruitment also suffered because young people wanted to serve in the army, but they preferred to serve with tanks than being an infantry guy. And so um, we lost them. Uh, they were kept, we sold a lot of them to uh, Brazil and some other countries. Brazil was a big uh, intake of uh, leopard ones. They still use them. Uh, even in the original version, the A1 version, and the Belgian modernized version didn't find any takers at that time, and they were sold to the company everybody knows, uh, has a big storage hole. And now uh, suddenly, after all these years, the old wire comes to life again, and it's a very expensive machine now. I found uh, that somebody asked 700,000 euros for a leopard tank, which was at that day uh, totally un unexpected. 
and uh, the old warrior uh, seems to be better than all the rest because it has a very, very good thermal imaging system and they will be sent to the country everybody knows about and finally it will be used. So technically, uh, right now in the Belgian army, there are still leopard, leopard hulls, leopard, leopard based vehicles going around. Mainly uh, Pioneer Panzer. Yep. Uh, they will also disappear into the country that everybody knows. Uh, and at the museum, paradoxically, we, have, uh, <laughs> we still have five operational Burger Panzers. So they are pretty much the last surviving of the, of the lot. Of the lot. And of course, you got the, uh, the Gepard as well. Ah, together, that's a totally other story. Um, uh, in, in the end, uh, at a certain point in the early 80s, we decided we needed air defense because we still had uh, the old 50 caliber machine guns and they were, they were not any good to modern uh, planes. So we decided uh, to buy 55 uh, Gepards. Okay. Uh, they were very early, uh, still with the analog computer system. So we had two battalions, uh, the 14th and the 35th Air Defense Regiment. And they had Gepards for about 10, 15 years. Then the wall came down. And so that same minister said, why do we need these things? They are very expensive. Eh? And so um, they were phased out. And we tried to sell them to a private company. Uh, nothing came about. And then in the end, uh, the company now, everybody knows with the big hangar full of leopard tanks bought them. And um, now they are in the process of being scrapped or taken apart to send to the country that everybody knows. <laughs> so what is the Belgian army using right now for its uh, vehicles and equipment? I mean, if it, does, it, does it still have a vehicle capable of providing fire support to infantry? Yes, we do. Uh, we, in the end, we converted to wheeled vehicles, uh, heavily armored. Of course, the point is when you go to Afghanistan, why should you have a leopard tank? But Seemingly other countries sent them, but we never did. Uh, we went to Mali, uh, we did uh, humanitarian operations. So the army became pretty much involved in this French thinking of the median brigade. Mm -hmm. And the French have a tendency for wheeled vehicles. So we, we, we did buy uh, the Piranha 3C, and one of the versions had a 30 millimeter cannon and a 90 millimeter cannon. The 90 millimeter cannon proved a bit a problem because the government of the day said, but what are we going to do with 90 millimeter? Nobody uses it. So we stopped them buying. Uh, we, we wanted to have, what was it, about 40 or 34, 40 battalion worth of it. Yeah. And we stopped at buying them at 18 pieces. So, okay. And now we, were, we are pretty much engaged with the French. We call it the CAMO, Capacité Motorisée, Motorized Capability. And we will get uh, César, Griffon and the Jaguar. And uh, that will be the first step. So that's the future of the Belgian army yes. then, is this? And there are rumors about that we should be interested in tanks, but um, I have no idea how it, this is a rumor for the moment, but you know, the, well, there is no fire without smoke. So this theory, no smoke uh, without uh, fire. Uh, so this theory about the Camo uh, design, was this before or after the Ukraine war started? Long time before already. Uh, we started studies, I think, if I remember correctly, about 10 years ago already, because we were very interested in the French concept of the median brigade. Uh, politically, no way we could get an armored brigade. Mm -hmm. uh, and what should we do with it, with an yeah. armored brigade? Because, voila, we were, we were totally eccentric of, the, of everything else. So we changed from a heavy mission to a cavalry mission. Uh, plug the holes, uh, you know, yeah. like the, uh, the old Western movies when the cavalry arrives with the bugle, well, that's, that's the job we, we were supposed to do. Uh, we also focused quite a lot on special forces because at that time it was considered to be critical to have special forces to be able to intervene rapidly and discreetly. And they did quite often. Uh, Somalia, okay, the CVRT came to its own again, but the distances were so big that you were better off, like the South Africans, or you were with better off with wheeled vehicles. Yes. So this French idea of this median brigade a do everything and can do anything brigade type um, appealed pretty much to the Belgian army general staff and so we are now pretty much engaged with the French in creating a, uh, several units like that. Yes. Does Belgium currently have any NATO deployments? Are they in Lithuania, Poland, anywhere like that? Oh yes, for a very small army we're still very active. Uh, we produce a lot of man hours for NATO. Uh, first, we do Baltic air defense with the F-16s, which are being replaced 
soon with the F-35. We have the Navy uh, doing as, uh, NATO missions all the time, uh, demining and, and being f uh, sending out our frigates to escort uh, French aircraft carriers or doing whatever. And then the Army is now deploying in uh, Romania and in L Latvia. So for a small army, uh, we are very active, yes, I think so. So what do you think, uh, what do you think the future of the Belgian Army is going to be then? It's uh, going to expand, it's going to come back to a more heavy role given current events or it's going to continue to specialize? Well, I think uh, some politicians would like us to specialize, but let's face it, uh, if you are in a, an organization like NATO, your political weight, your decision-making weight, depends on what you can provide. Mm -hmm. So if you say, oh, we only provide light forces and the Norwegians have to provide tank battalion and they get killed, nobody will like this eh? because the Belgians were moving out. So we already had a dodgy uh, reputation of not the soldiers themselves because they are professionals and they do whatever needs to be done. But on the political level, we already had a very dodgy reputation of not really wanting to engage ourselves in, in very uh, heavy uh, conflicts. Uh, they always said, well, we don't have the means, uh, but voila, at the end, uh, it's like uh, crying for wolf. Uh, nobody believes you anymore. So slowly now what we see now, concrete for the army, uh, because Air Force, Navy, they are always kept themselves busy and kept them, they had a mission. They, they knew really what they wanted. Uh, for the army now, we see um, units being dispersed over the country because one of the problems was that they were all located at two main bases. Mm -hmm. Uh, for recruitment, uh, you, it narrows your recruitment base. So now they decide to spread them more out, so to open the recruitment base. So it's regional recruiting. So if I'm from a particular town like Liège, I will go to a unit near Liège. I'm not, I, it's not like I can go anywhere. No, uh, where you had to go to Marchand Famen, mandatory because that was it. Yeah. Now you have the choice. Uh, you can go to Spa. There is an infantry battalion in Spa. They have an armored car squadron now in Tournai, which is more to the French border. Uh, they have an infantry company expanding to a battalion at the Belgian coast because that was an empty space. Yeah. So they are slowly relocating these outfits and then of course uh, recruitment is going up again. But it's very slow because our economy is thriving and we miss personnel in every sector. Yeah. So when the economy is good, that's bad for the army. When the economy is bad, that's good for the army. So, uh, voila. And most of our surrounding countries are, are facing the same problem uh, anyway. Even the American army has recruitment problems. So we will, for the moment, work on the, for what I gather, uh, I'm not in the general staff uh, head, uh, for what I gather, we will focus on this camo program because we didn't get any vehicles yet. Mm -hmm. uh, the French always have this tendency of having good vehicles but not produce them. <laughs> but voila, we're getting there. Uh, they will come in slowly. Uh, then we will create these new battalions and armor or not, uh, I don't think we will have uh, 334 whatever tanks again, but maybe a, a, a tank battalion, uh, that should be possible I think, uh, but you have all these factors coming in. Eh? What tank are you going to choose? Hmm? Not a Russian for uh, <laughs> uh, If you choose American, ooh, 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 the American tank, ooh, ooh, very hush hush. If you say, I want the leopard, ah, oh, well, but we haven't das nicht, eh? the, the, the Germans do not <laughs> produce enough. And the Leclerc, yeah, well, the Leclerc, oh, are we going to buy French again? Uh, but you already had Camo, so you see it, uh, you see yeah. it coming. You're uh. going to be a subsidiary of the French army. Well, for the moment, they, it's the only army that had something which we could use. Yeah. Uh, the Germans didn't have any program, the Americans didn't have any program, uh, the British didn't have any program which we could use and plug into it. Uh, we will now probably refrain of these big inter-European programs like Airbus A400 or the NH90 helicopter. They produced uh, good machines but ex extremely expensive. Uh, it, we will have to see. Uh, we will have to see what it comes. We have this French-German tank program uh, which struggles for the moment because the Germans are jealous of their tank industry and they have now the perfect training ground and testing ground whereas the French with the Leclerc they stopped production. Mm. Uh, they still have some operational but not too much and they don't want to send them to uh, the country everybody knows. Um, 
the politics are very difficult, certainly in Europe, we have 27, 27 member states, so you can understand uh, what problems all this generates. The easiest way is to go to the Americans and say, can you deliver us to please uh, 54 Abram tanks, uh, whatever. The Americans will probably say yes, when do we have to deliver? <laughs> but the political decision making is it's not there. there. It's not okay, there. well, we've gone, we've gone a little bit outside of the normal frame of reference for here, but uh, it's, a, it's interesting and it's always good to hear William talk. So. And thus we come to a conclusion on the series of interviews on Belgian army history. But we are not done with Belgium yet. There's more videos to come that we filmed there, just not so much on the academic side of things. Oh, don't worry, I'll get to climb over a couple more vehicles, uh, some of which are uniquely Belgian. So again, feel free to click on the subscribe button if you have not yet done so. And apparently that little bell does things as well. And well, I will talk to you on the next one. Hope you enjoyed so far. Take care.